Hi people, it's Archivist here, and today I want to make a quick video talking about the PlayStation 5 and my thoughts on it. I wanted to do a more fully structured, full-blown review of it, but unfortunately there's a bit of a technical issue on my side where my capture card just is not working with my PlayStation 5. Works fine on the Series X, but I just cannot get it to work on the PS5 for whatever reason, so I think I'm going to need to get a new one, but in the meantime, just to facilitate some kind of vague context on this video, I'm going to be just using the share button on the PS5. Unfortunately, the compression is absolutely horrific on it, so it's not all that great, but it will do for now. But my goal is to certainly get a new capture card so that I can take uh, footage directly from the PS5 and hopefully do some more reviews on PS5 games. I, I really want to do a Miles Morales review, but I just can't do it with footage like this. So uh, yeah, you're just seeing some uh, Ghost of Tsushima on the Iki Island uh, DLC in the director's cut version. But yeah, my, my thoughts on the PS5, and I am very happy with the console. And I think the highest compliment I can give it is that if I compare it to the two PlayStations that I personally am the most aware of in terms of their launch era, this has got to be the best. So if I go back to the PlayStation 4, which I recall there being very high opinions of the PS4 early on, but if you think about it, it wasn't all that great. Uh, first of all, there was no backwards compatibility at all on the PlayStation 4, which meant that when it came out, all it could rely on was its newly released PlayStation 4 games. You could not go back and play PlayStation 3 games to sort of tide you over while you waited for more uh, current gen games to come out, which was a big detractor, I think, for me at the time. I remember really struggling to, to find games to play. And also the games that came out initially they weren't amazing. We had like Killzone Shadowfall and we had Knack and of course the suite of third party games like Call of Duty Ghosts and so on and so forth. But within that first year, the PlayStation 4 was not the most amazing console. It became an amazing console over time, having some of the, the best games of all time on it. But in that first year, it was yeah a little bit mediocre. And if we go back even further to the PlayStation 3, well, there was backwards compatibility, which meant you could bolster your library. This did actually end up going away on future models because it really inflated the price of the PlayStation 3. But I think the big issue with the PlayStation 3 at launch and actually for a few more years was that the third party games were not very good. The cell processor was almost too advanced for its own good and developers would struggle to know how to best code their games for it which meant that the 360 equivalent games would often be superior. Even though the PlayStation 3 wasn't technically less powerful than its competition, it was more complex. Over time, gradually, this uh, began to change and developers understood the cell processor and were able to get, I think, relative parity, if I recall, by the end. But in that first year, which is what we're concerned with in this discussion, definitely had a weakness on the third party front with PlayStation 3. So if we take those two points of comparison, I would go back further, but I was too young to remember the launch of the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1, so I'm going to stick with what I know. Um, but comparing it to those two PlayStations, the PlayStation 5 first year is phenomenal. Uh, we have very strong backwards compatibility support. Almost all PlayStation 4 games you can play on a PlayStation 5. Uh, some of them are getting 60 frames per second patches, a lot of the first party titles are completely for free, which I'm really in love with that. Uh, I think Horizon Zero Dawn has been the most recent, and that's given me a bit of a reason to go back to it. We've also had some amazing exclusives. We've had uh, Mars Morales, which, although not a full game, I think the quality just uh, really makes up for its length. Uh, we also had uh, the Demon Souls remake, which actually motivated me to go and play that game. I would never have played it in its original form. It's just, I guess, too, too antiquated for me visually. Um, and this gave me a good reason to go back and play it and really enjoy it. And Ratchet and Clank, of course, which is a fantastic title. And Returnal as well came out as a bit of a surprise to me, but I did really like Returnal as someone who doesn't generally play roguelikes, but I, I really liked it. And we've just had the uh, showcase, of course. We're going to have uh, God of War Ragnarok on the horizon. And, well, speaking of horizon, there's also Forbidden West. Uh, so great games to come and great games that have already come out. It, a, a fantastic console in its first year, all in all. 
and I have very few complaints about it. It's just a very solid device. And we've got some innovations in the fact that the controller is now using more advanced haptics, like the kind of thing you might find in an iPhone. And the triggers, I, I think the implementation of triggers varies game to game. Some I find it to be a little bit of an annoyance, but some I think it really adds to the immersion. Really any driving game like Dirt 5, it's amazing how much more I enjoy Dirt 5 for having the resistance and the triggers. It really makes you feel like you're driving over a, a kind of a rickety road and you're struggling to push it forward. I really like what the resistance and the triggers can bring. And graphically, uh, the power jump on the PS4 Pro is fantastic. It's over twice as powerful. So there are some games which ran at 30 FPS on the PS4 Pro, which can now run at 60 FPS and then get more visual benefits on top of it. Like as you're seeing Ghost of Tsushima in the director's cut, it isn't just a 60 FPS boost. It's also got a resolution boost as well on top of that. There's also that all important SSD boost that the PlayStation 5 gets over the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. And that does make a world of difference. I used to play a lot of third party games on PC because of the fact that the storage was just so slow in the previous consoles using a conventional spinning disc. And the SSD really makes the console feel so much snappier in so many different ways. And there's the passive benefits you get across really all games on loading times, but then there's very uh, interesting examples such as Ratchet and Clank where the SSD is leveraged in creative ways such as throwing you very quickly through multiple levels at a time which can actually impact gameplay. We haven't seen a lot of that yet and it is going to take developers very deliberately targeting the SSD in order to improve the way that they design games but um, it's not something we'll even see on all games because it won't be appropriate for every game but it's nice to see that new paradigm of design unlocked. One uh, negative you might say of the PlayStation 5 is that on the first party titles there has been a price jump so the games are more expensive now. However, I am not that against this. Obviously I don't want to pay more but at the same time the first party titles are of such a high quality that I don't mind giving a little bit extra to get that quality. You know, so to me, I will pay more to get better, I guess is the simple way of saying it. Now, if we get to a point where first party games start coming out from Sony and they're subpar, then I'm gonna look at that price and think, no, it's not worth it. And naturally I'll be voting with my wallet like everyone else and I won't be uh, buying the games. But for all the time that Sony are making games where the quality of the game matches the, the price they're asking for I, I'm gonna pay it because you know that that's how it works you, you you pay the amount of money for things that you think are worth it so I will continue to do that and furthermore something I do like is that their first party games do not have microtransactions uh, I'm trying to think of an exception maybe there's one that's just not coming to mind but I, I certainly can't think of anything that's close to like pay to win and something I did say in a video way back in 2017 was that I wouldn't mind it if I had to pay more for games if it meant that microtransactions would be kept out of them. And I guess I'd be a little bit of a hypocrite if I didn't now say, yeah, I'm okay with that. So uh, it's definitely something I think I should mention because for some people that will be a big disadvantage. When I was younger... Uh, buying a game new was a, a big deal. I had to do lots of uh, chores around the house uh, to make up the money to do it. A lot of the time I had to just rent games because I couldn't afford to buy them new. So I think for younger gamers that will be a, a significant disadvantage actually now thinking about it. But uh, just for me, because I can really only speak to my own situation, I am happy to pay more to, to get a, a higher quality. Uh, but again, you know, the moment that that quality starts going away, it's going to be a different conversation. So uh, that's my feeling on that. Uh, but it, it, it is a negative. And, and also just another negative, but it's a negative that is going to be addressed, is that if you want to expand the storage uh, and keep obviously the storage expansion on the same speed as the internal SSD, so you want to uh, buy and uh, plug in a, an internal SSD, uh, at the moment, you can't do that, but it is on the horizon to do it. So I think the 600 or so gigabytes you have in the PlayStation 5, or available in the PlayStation 5, I should say, 
It's not unworkable by any stretch of the imagination. I've had to uninstall very little in my time using it, but it does prevent you from building up that wide collection of games. And uh, it's a current disadvantage, but it's one that should, with, with any luck, go away. Also, okay, this is me really nitpicking. Uh, and I will just say that my PlayStation 5 is a lot quieter than my PlayStation 4 Pro. However, it does make a little bit of a buzzy noise. I think it's the electronics inside, coil wine, I, I think is what's going on. And in a very quiet room when the game isn't particularly loud, I can absolutely hear it. And it does only really apply in certain situations, like Miles Morales is a big offender there. It can get quite loud and quite buzzy when I'm playing that game, but all it takes is the game getting a bit louder, so maybe I turn up the volume, put a pair of uh, headphones on, and uh, all of a sudden it's completely gone. So from a hardware perspective, that's probably my only is it my only gripe uh, i guess it does also have that uh, situation where when the plastic cools down after it's been hot for a while it does get a bit creaky which is very common amongst consoles but there are definitely some models that are affected more so than others and this is this is on the upper end of plastic creakiness at least in my environment it will, it will definitely depend on how naturally warm your environment is because it's the change in temperature from what's uh, being generated on the components versus the external temperature of your environment causing the cool down and if it's happening very quickly you can get some creakiness so uh, could be uh, my environment as well happy to, to say that but yeah it's happening more than my other consoles basically is what i'll say but overall the playstation 5 is, is a fantastic device I, i'm really enjoying it i just hope they keep this up you know if, if the worst thing i can say is if if the only thing i can think to say in terms of where does this console go is just keep doing what you're doing that's a pretty good thing in my book it's not just about promises of the future it's things right now that are good with the uh, sony playstation 5 i guess on a wider scale, my anxiety around it is I really hope it doesn't break because uh, as I'm talking right now, it's very hard to get your hands on the PlayStation 5 because the demand is so extreme for the console. Uh, there are obviously scalpers, unfortunately, are taking advantage of the stock shortages. Uh, there's just uh, component shortages due to just COVID aftermath uh, situations. So all of that is coming together to make the PlayStation 5 a very hard thing to come by. I can only imagine how long it will be to where I can just walk into a game shop and actually see it available and say, yep, I'll pick one up uh, and buy one. It's very hard to acquire one. I suppose I was incredibly lucky looking back on it to get one as a pre-order uh, when it came out to get it on the UK launch. So, you know, and if you are after one and you know, you're thinking oh, it's frustrating. Well, I do know someone recently who they didn't get one at launch and they just subscribed to all of the Twitter alerts, uh, every uh, notification they could get from any retailer and they did manage to get one eventually. So it's not an impossible task. It's just harder than I suppose it, it should be, right? I do wonder, are Sony kicking themselves for pricing the PlayStation 5 as they did? Obviously, I'm happy they did price it. As they did, I think it's a very reasonable ask for the hardware. But they could have asked for so much more uh, and still had it sold really well. And then they could have just literally reduced the price maybe after a year or so. And I don't know if sales would be affected. But then again, obviously, the, the goodwill aspect might have gone down because they might have been seen as profiteering from the, uh, the pandemic. So... And a reputation, especially in the world of gaming, reputation is all important. So yeah, these have been my thoughts on the PlayStation 5, a fantastic console by all accounts. As always, people, thanks very much for watching and see you next time.